Welcome to this second installment of Diary of a Podcaster from Oz to NZ, celebrating individuals who celebrate national and international cinema via their podcasts, among other things. As always, I'm Jose, your host, and unlike Captain Kirk, I don't recall the last star date of my long, of my lost, let me start that again. As always, I'm Jose, and unlike Captain Kirk, I don't recall the star date of my last log entry or haircut. In fact, I've come to suspect that lockdown will become the new flat top of 2021, and we just let our locks down. So you can cue the crickets. Last week, we kicked off this series with Matthew Eels of Cinema Australia. This week, we jet back to the east side of Australia into Sydney and chat with a dynamic duo who have garnered reputations at both, as both film and TV critics and podcasters. The first member of this podcasting pair is known for his acumen as a film critic, being a member of both Film Critics Circle of Australia and the Australian Film Critics Association. His works have been published in Film Inc, Encore, Inside and Empire. Since early 2012, he's been the founder and editor-in-chief of Screen Space, Fearless Opinions Above, About All Things Cinema, and that's the tagline from your site. And when he's not wearing his festival director hat for Monster Fest and the Sydney Science Fiction Festival, you can tune your dials into 2GB and catch him every Monday for a rundown on new release, both on the silver screen and the home screen. Hello, and thank you for joining me, Simon Foster. Jose, from the moment you said acumen, I had no idea what you were talking about, but thank you, <laughs> but thank you very much for having us on, uh, on this terrific endeavour of yours. I'm really proud to be here. Oh, uh, look, I appreciate it. And making up the second creative component purely based on the order in which I wrote this intro down, <laughs> is a well-known media, screen culture, and TV critic whose written contributions have been regularly featured on SBS online, along with his daily newsletter at his website, Always Be Watching. In addition to being a former Media Week deputy editor, he's also a passionate podcaster, producing such titles as Batman Land, Orville Land, and the Media Report podcast, just to name a few, as well as being as well as being beamed across the airwaves on Brizzy Radio 4BC and ABC Gold Coast. Hello and welcome, Dan Barrett. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, good evening, Jose. Now you were talking about star dates a moment ago, and that got me curious to know what comprises of a star date exactly, because oh, I right. wasn't quite sure. I've got a lifelong viewership of Star Trek, but you know, I had no idea. So there's apparently the original format format of these star dates, and there's the revised ver version of the star dates. <laughs> And so to work out your star date, uh, you use the, okay, so a traditional star date in, say, for example, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Here we you go. have a number like 46379.1. Now, the four represents the 24th century. So if we're working out our star date, it would be we're in the 21st century. So to begin with number one, and right. then you've got the season that you're in. So I guess it's August. So let's say it's, we'll go by month. So I guess 108. And then we've got the thing, which is the number of days. So if we were going to work it out from our last potential haircuts from the shutdown, what's that like 43 days? So what, I'm going to go with that. Yeah. So we'll say it's start date 108, 43 points and it's eight o'clock at night. It's a point eight. So uh, there's our start date right there. I love it. Thank you so much. Yes. But can, <laughs> you, do the Kelsa run, but can you do the Kelsa run in less than 12 parsecs? That's what I want to know. 15 parsecs. It's disappointing. <laughs> Look, gentlemen, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this. Um, and look, and I really hope you don't enjoy or regret the decisions. The night is still young, so, you know, we'll see how it fares out. Sure. <laughs> I want to get some housekeeping out of the way like I normally do. So if you enjoyed our last episode as much as Matthew Eels enjoys a garlic butter pan seared porterhouse steak, I feel like I should have some kind of music that accompanies that. Then get your keyboards warmed up and head on over to our Facebook page or Twitter at Diary of Crowd F1 for a cookout and cornucopia of culinary chats. And please subscribe and reshare the episode so the momentum for this podcast and Heat's film Christmas continue during the production hiatus. So, gentlemen, the launch of your respective personal online spaces, it's allowed you to have complete control of your discussions, opinions and activities relating to film, TV and really whatever personally interests you. Um, Simon, I just wanted to first ask, where did the evolution for uh, screen space first come about? Uh, it came about, I had been writing for SBS. I was one of the uh, first group of journalists who um, worked under Fiona Williams when SBS Film was launched 
um, in the wake of David and Margaret leaving, and they started to try to do have a much bigger online presence. Um, and I got some great work and did a lot of work for them, but I kept pitching ideas to them. They kept getting knocked back. So I thought what I need to do is find a space where I can um, uh, write about, you know, what I enjoy in the world of film and, and write with um, my own voice. And, and, and that's where Screen Space came about. It allowed me to, you know, stay in touch with... Um, publicists and film distributors and companies like that when when the work wasn't forthcoming um and that all came about uh, for many years before i'd been a, a a sales rep in the home video industry yes kids i'm that old um <laughs> so i had a, a a history of being able to talk at length about film and sort of gab on about movies from you know my film buff days in high school and being a you know a film going tragic for all those years so the skill i got as a sales rep um led into uh writing uh which led into broadcasting um and that's when i got started to get work with outfits like wsfm here in sydney and abc radio and um abc fm currently as well so i've always sort of had kind of the gift of the gab when it came to things that interest me the most and i've always said i couldn't be a back when i was a sales rep i said i couldn't go from selling movies every day to selling washing machines or cars and with all due respect to washing machine and car salesman. It's just not something I could do. I was passionate about the product because I was talking about movies and that's what led to everything I guess I'm still doing with movies. Uh, um, I thought, Dan, I'd ask the same question, but for always be watching, um, I'm guessing there's a similar amalgamation of interests that led to that creation. Yeah, I guess my story probably goes back further than Simon. So while he was there peddling in the home video trade, <laughs> And what is home video exactly, Simon? Is that like Blockbuster and Stranger Things? Is that what you're yeah, talking that's about? What it, yeah, that's what it back. We, used, we came out of the caves, we crawled out of the ocean and formed legs, and then we were back in, we were straight into the home video industry. Okay, yeah, okay, that, that tracks for me. No, no, so my background probably begins back in about 2002, 2003. I was at the Brisbane Writers Festival. I was an attendee there. I wasn't obviously on a panel or anything. Mm -hmm. I was a media studies student at the time. And I was just sitting there listening to a panel discussion that was, I can't even remember who it was. I want to say it was Brian Johns, who was one of the former um, heads of the ABC. And I can't remember who else was on the panel, but they were just talking about the rise of this exciting new format called blogging. Is it pretty, like, hold with me, kids. It's pretty exciting. It's a <laughs> brand new form of media here. But they were just basically saying that uh, anyone can start a blog now and just obvious things. But like in 2002, this is kind of a revelation to me. And I was someone who was getting very frustrated by, look, I lived in Brisbane as a one newspaper town, the Courier Mail, and I used to be very annoyed and frustrated by the film and TV coverage in that newspaper. And so that was just kind of reverberating in my head, thinking about how much I just really just, no, I won't use the language I want to use, uh, just how frustrated I was by this newspaper experience. And right. then they started talking about blogging. So I'm like, well, I'll, I'll launch my own blog. So I created this blog called Televised Revolution. So I kicked that off and it was just blogging about TV and I had ideas that I'd talk about like sort of breaking news and try to sort of turn into like a magazine style thing. But at heart, I'm very, very lazy. So I never quite invested as much time and re like energy into the blog as I probably should have. Little did I realize that if I had done that, I probably could have beaten websites in Australia like TV Tonight to their own game by a couple of years. But, you know, whatever. Uh, but basically I was posting reviews. I was posting just general thoughts on the TV industry. At a certain point, I thought, what's this podcasting thing that I've kind of heard a few things about? So I got on board with podcasting really early. So I launched a televised revolution podcast. This is back in about 2005, 2006. So whenever podcasting was like right at its like nascent form, I was there creating this podcast. I convinced this guy that I worked with, Chris, that, hey, let's start this podcast. He thought I was crazy and he was probably right to think that. <laughs> But we started this podcast and we recorded probably about 10 or 11 episodes together. We migrated the podcast over to become a radio show through community radio in Brisbane at 4 Z. And I ran the podcast as a radio show for years and years, uh, probably stopped in about 2015, I think. Wow. And that coincided with me moving to Sydney. And we kept the podcast going for a little while. And once I'd hit Sydney, I was also working at Media Week. So there was a bit of a conflict of interest in running this podcast talking about the TV industry at the same time that I'm working for a magazine and contributing to two different Media Week podcasts about the TV industry. So like there were suddenly conflicts there, but the publisher, James Manning, didn't really mind too much. So I kept that running. 
Unfortunately, the end of my televised revolution dreams sort of hit a brick wall when I started working for Simon's wife, Fiona, over at SBS. And she said, oh, that podcast you're doing, you probably can't really do that while you're over here. And I knew I was on a good run at the time and I'd been doing it for, you know, about 10, 12 years by that point. And I thought this is probably just what I need to actually stop doing this. So I killed off the podcast, but I had this secret dream, which was that the day that I left SBS, I'd kick off a new podcast. I didn't kick Mm -hmm. it off exactly the day, but I started the planning for it. And a few weeks after I'd left SBS, I started the Always Be Watching podcast to join in with the newsletter that I was running at the time. So the self-publishing kicked off once more. But yeah, so it's kind of been a constant stream of TV, online publishing and podcasting, just as a sort of background to just my nine to five jobs throughout my, you know, many years of media working now. And I should point out that, that, um, what Dan and I do now with our screen watching podcast, Dan is very much um, the the hands on producer and technical sort of expert in the show. My background, um, all those years talking on the radio, prepared me to be able to you know talk into a mic and give me some sort of um, aspect of control over that side of how I present myself and how I talk. But um, Dan convinced me very early on that it's a very different world, the world of podcasting. Um, and I've had to adapt my delivery and how I present my information and the sort of conversations I was I was more comfortable having on the radio with in, in podcast form. And Dan's been invaluable in that regard. So I, I bring an element of knowledge about film and, and to a certain aspect TV. But Dan's very much the, the podcast guy in the, in the mix here. Yeah, because I guess podcasts really are quite different to presenting on the radio. So I've done Mm. a fair bit of radio over the years as well. So at the moment, you can hear me on ABC Gold Coast and 4BC. But also I've done like a fair bit of Radio National over my years. So I was the TV critic on RN Breakfast for a couple of years with Fran Kelly uh, and various other radio things around the place as well. But I guess when you're on the radio talking about film or TV or whatever your subject matter is, you're talking to an audience who are listening to you is like part of a package of a number of different things they might hear across the course of an hour. So, you know, they might be hearing about world news affairs and then suddenly there's a TV segment. And then straight after that, it'll go off to talking about, um, what else is there in the world? Sorry, I thought about TV. Oh, there's suddenly, sport, Dan. Sport. You can't, we just come off the Olympics for God's Yes, sake. that's right. Oh, I, I've heard of it. I've heard rumors. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they'll go off to sport and then it's like a magazine style experience on the radio. Yeah. But a podcast, you've got a dedicated audience who are there to hear a very specific subject matter. And if they're there to hear a specific subject matter, they're probably already bought into a certain amount of passion and they're probably bringing with it a certain level of pre-enthusiasm and pre-knowledge about their subject matter. So with a podcast, you can talk to people as though they're coming into it from an entry-level standpoint, but you also need to provide, I guess, maybe a little bit more ground to say, you know, if you actually do know what we're talking about, and chances are you probably know more than what we're actually aware of ourselves as we're trying to profess to be experts in whatever it is that we're discussing. Like you kind of need to provide space for all types of listeners, but also just know that you do have more dedicated listeners than a radio experience provides. The passion and the camaraderie that comes across between the two of you is, I think, one of the elements that makes listening to the podcast screen watching enjoyable. And I say that because the I remember the episode I listened to most recently, there was two. One, I had to listen to the Rennie Harlan episode because I think he's an absolute legend. So that was fantastic, Simon. And there was one where the two of you were actually calling in from Dan's house. And I don't remember exactly which it was, but and it may have happened more than once. Just that what I do recall is a reference where you said, like all podcasters, I'm here with both my dogs at my feet as uh, as they do it. So <laughs> are they with you today? <laughs> Uh, my dogs are at the other end of the house at the moment because okay. it, it's dinner time. There's a couple of biscuits that has been given out to them. They're currently noshing some rawhide. So they're not really interested in me. But if that door was open, they would be by my feet by the end of the hour. Yeah, we, we should point out to our listeners that both Dan and I are dog people. Um, we think that cats are the demon spawn. Um, <laughs> so we do, you know, if we lose any listeners over that, I'm okay with it. That's really unfair to demon spawn. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And I'm, I've got no preference neither or way, um, but demons spawn all the way. Uh, look, Matthew Eels, he shared with me in my interview with him is this obsession that he has with um, Superman. And I wanted to know if there's a similar film that either of you have an obsession with and to the point where would you consider doing, you know, a kind of minute by minute breakdown a la Blake Howard 
for that film? Yep. Um, yeah. uh, yes, there, there are those sort of films. And, and uh, I loved what Blake did with the, the, um, the heat. One, oh, yeah, he, with heat. One heat minute was, was incredible. And, I, and he, was, he, was, he was doing good fellas too, wasn't he? Or one of the other ones. I, he started on one. I can't remember now. Oh, no. He's done Zodiac and. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so he did the, all the President's Minutes was the podcast. That's, That's it, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's terrific at what he does. My sort of knowledge and, and the, the the deep diving I sometimes go into on cinema on the podcast certainly lends itself to that, and I'd be happy to do something on, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the films of my generation like Die Hard or The Breakfast Club or there's the films that sort of made me fall in love with movies like Star Wars and Close Encounters or there's... The, the films that the more I learn about movies, the more I realise why they're so important, like the 2001s and the Citizen Kane's and the Lawrence of Arabia, stuff like that. So um, in terms of a minute by minute breakdown, I'm a little bit ashamed to say it may be Peter Sellers in The Party, which is my favourite comedy of all time. Um, there are elements of it that may not sort of hold up too well in, in the current sure. climate. Elements? <laughs> <laughs> Well, when I say elements, I mean about 75% of the film, but the point being that um, it is still a very funny movie and I'd love to it do is. a podcast on that. And you're probably more TV sort of leaning, I guess, Dan, but is there a movie that... That's right. Uh, there's a few. So I always joke, so when Star Wars Minute, which is the podcast that kicked off the Minute by Minute movie uh, podcasts, when that's kicked off, I always thought it'd be fun to do a news radio Minute by Minute podcast where you're doing every episode of news radio, but a minute at a time. But if I was going to, I think that'd hold up. But if I was going to do movies, so there's probably three films that I've actually actively thought about doing these minute by minute podcasts before. The nice. first one is probably one of my favorite movies of all time, The Untouchables. I think that yes. would hold up remarkably well to a minute by minute watch. And there's so many great set pieces and so much that happens within each of those set pieces. That I think it withstands the scrutiny of the minute by minute format. I saw, I saw that six times at the movies, The Untouchables. I wow. love that film. It's one of my all time favorites. See, I was a little bit too young to have seen it in the cinema. I grew up watching that as a VHS classic and then just through watching on Foxtel time in and time out. But for some reason, The Untouchables, I never thought I'd get seared on the cinema. But from that first time I got to see it in the cinema, I don't think there's been a six month period where I haven't had the opportunity to see it on the big screen since. It just keeps on appearing around the place. And my God, that film plays well on the big screen. Mm. Uh, but one of the other films I'd like to do is I think Point Break would be a very fun minute by minute podcast. There's so much great dialogue through that film that, you know, this uh, is there though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, great dialogue. No, it's a fun movie. You can't get past that. But the film that if I was actually going to sit down and do the podcast and it wasn't just purely a passion project, mm. but really podcasting for profit would be my real consideration. The podcast, I think, is probably a gangbusters idea to do would be one based around Pretty Woman. Now, I haven't seen okay. Pretty Woman since I was a kid, but I really think there's an audience to just revel in the world of Pretty Woman. And I'd be more than willing to capitalize on that. For the value of nostalgia, you're thinking oh, that would be driving. No, for the value of making money from other people's nostalgia. <laughs> oh, even better. <laughs> That's the spirit, Dan. <laughs> That's what I'm all about. I've done podcasting for free for too long. I yeah. want to see some of the lucre come through. Yeah, no, there's... I get that. Look, I, I wanted to jump into some film festivals and just have a quick chat regarding Monster Fest and Sydney Science uh, Fiction Festival. The um, Look, how did that opportunity come about, Simon, for you to become director? Um, I, through my work with SBS and through my journalism work, I've made a lot of contacts with the film festival community um, and people like uh, Grant Hardy at Monster Fest and Tom Pappas at the Sci-Fi Film Festival, which is the other festival, um, they recognised that I could contribute in some meaningful way to the to the programming of the events and ultimately the running of events. So it, it sort of came about through a, a natural progression. I was with um, with SBS, I was fortunate to be able to travel to places like the Cannes Film Festival and um, pretty much every capital city festival here in Australia. Um, so I had a lot of on the ground film festival experience. And uh, when the sort of opportunity came up to uh, sort of maximize my love of genre films mm -hmm. of horror and of science fiction, um, it was very easy to sort of fall into a conversation with those guys about starting the festival up. So I've been with Monster Fest, I've been the festival director of the Sydney leg of Monster Fest now for a few years, four years, I think. Um, right. 
And prior to that, uh, I was the program director at Sci-Fi Film Festival for three years, but two years that ran and then last year, which was cancelled. And then out of that position, I, st I sort of broke away and started up the, the Sydney Science Fiction Film Festival, which is coming up for its second edition in uh, November this year. I wanted to look at if you've had any challenges or maybe you're facing some current challenges with the uh, Sci-Fi Festival coming up, given this Delta variant of COVID. Oh God. How, Get so comfortable, where are things... everyone. Well, this, is, this could go a while. Um, well, we launched at the end of the lockdown period last year, or the, or the sort of the, the loosening of the pandemic conditions last year. Um, I think we, we, uh, we're on at the Actors Centre Australia, which is a big sort of auditorium um, in the Italian Forum at Leichhardt here in Sydney. And yes. um, they've got this beautiful state-of-the-art 300-seat cinema um the night of horror film festival went in there a couple of weeks before us and then we came in early november last year and we were sort of the first two festivals that started up again after the the um lockdown period or the, or the pandemic conditions last year so it was tough working at 50 percent capacity we were very very fortunate that the that the venue was very kind to us uh, with regards to rates and um the conditions that we could operate under and they were learning centers so they were already sort of um very bound by government conditions and they were very sort of familiar with all the rules and regulations that came with being in a, in a pandemic environment. So um, we didn't have to do too much learning there. They were able to hand, absorb that side of things for us. Um, we've been very fortunate that the international sector um, and the Australian sector, but certainly the international sector response to a, the launch of a capital city festival um, for science fiction and fantasy films here in Sydney the, the, the pickup was great. Um, last year with our first festival, we maxed out at 71 submissions via the, the online submission site. Um, mm. With still three months to go uh, this year, we're at 143. So instantly we've had this sort of growth phase, which is which has completely taken me by surprise. And we've got submissions from like 30 different countries. So we've been, we've, the pickup has been really strong and I've sort of tried to generate a, a really strong social media element, um, use my broadcasting skills and podcasting sort of network and, and creating my own sort of avenues of, of communication with other film festival directors around the world to um, establish ourselves alongside Berlin and alongside Boston and London and Miami, all of which have great science fiction film festivals so that to create this web so that the, the network of filmmakers know about us when those other festivals are spoken of as well. Um, so just sort of building from that ground level startup festival base um, has been the challenge. And I wish I could say I did it with some kind of master plan or some kind mm. of business acumen. There's that word, I'm gonna start using that now. Um, <laughs> uh, acumen, but I don't have that. It's really been um, by the seat of my pants and with the help of a group of incredible people around me, the committee members, Travis Johnson and my wife, Fiona and Crystal and Virat and um, Anthony at the Actors Centre. So it's been this small group of people who've, I've, whose passion for science fiction and for film festivals I've tapped into, which have, have really helped out. I like the way you are phrased, you know, by the seat of your pants, because there's no better place to have your pants in on the seat. So I'm glad that worked out. Very true, it, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, because now I... I'm starting to vibe with what you guys are trying to do here. I'm enjoying this. Um, a serious question, though, because independent cinema, it's a great mirror for examining and opening discussions about um, social and political landscapes. So I wanted to know if you've noticed from the creatives and the submissions and the films that are going to be chosen, if there's been an artistic shift in the storytelling that's heavily featuring the impact, and I promise this will be the last COVID-related question, but it's so ingrained at the moment. So has there been a shift artistically that they're going down that path in their storytelling? Uh, to, enough to the extent that we will be uh, programming a, a strand of the festival called Pandemic Pictures, which specifically right. speak to both the like a perception of the world in, under pandemic conditions and under lockdown, um, and also films that overcame those limitations in their filming style in their narrative style so so that is that is certainly a very big part of the 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 submissions that i've got this year um films 
with incredible imagination have sort of adapted to to um, the pandemic climate and, and the conditions of, of shooting during a pandemic. Um, science fiction and horror and fantasy have always been um, amazing genres for, for reflecting society and, mm. and the, you know, the example that anyone who knows anything about horror films or, or genre films uses are the, the Romero zombie films that, you know, yes. the first one was about Vietnam and the next one was about consumerism and the next Consum- one was yes. about greed in the 80s. So they, they all sort of reflect the, the sort of overwhelming social um, conditions at the time uh, and that hasn't changed at all. We've had some really smart... Uh, very incisive sort of commentary pieces come through that use incredible visuals and 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 um, very sort of complex narrative beats and storytelling elements to to, to comment on society, not just the pandemic, um, but also there's been a wave of films coming out of the um, uh, Me Too movement and the gender equality debates and and um, about the political situation in the US. There's been some really sort of fierce polemics from both sides um, of, of the political divide uh, in the form of science fiction um, and fantasy films. So, yeah, that hasn't changed. And if anything, filmmakers have become even more revved up in recent years um, in, the, in the way they sort of confront these issues. Hey, Simon, can I ask a question? So if I was a up and coming filmmaker who was uh, really in this sort of stage of still submitting to film festivals and trying to get my name out there, one of the things I would be very sort of cognizant of is that there has been a bit of a shift towards online streamers and the potential for short films that have a little bit of buzz behind them to maybe become seen as possible pilots for ongoing TV shows, or at least inspire the idea of getting some money to turn it into a TV show. Have you noticed any changes in terms of the structure and the way that ideas, I guess, are maybe being presented in short films, where it's sort of shifting from being purely about the film, where you're sort of looking at things going, this kind of feels like it's more of a TV pilot presentation than it is a short film in itself? Um, the proof of concept short has always been a, a, a factor in, in when you program for festivals. Um, look, I'll be completely blunt. There's nothing more frustrating about watching a short film until you realise about halfway through that, okay, this isn't going to win. This isn't a self-contained story. This is clearly mm. a, a kind of a pitch session for a, mm. a bigger project. Um, in answer to your question, uh, no, I haven't seen any significant change in the number of those sort of films that are coming through. Um, and if there is an element of the filmmaking community that thinks there's a new avenue or a new pathway to go down in, in, to, the, to the Netflixes or the Amazons of this world, um, that hasn't immediately sort of shown itself in, in the, the science fiction realm. In the horror realm, um, with the emergence of the Shutter platform, um, mm-hmm that's playing a huge part in f- horror film festivals around the world and particularly the second and third tier of distribution in horror films. Um, uh, I know my friends at A Night of Horror um, have had terrible problems with films that they were interested in a few months out from the festival, then announcing that they've already been secured by Shudder out of the, the latest horror festival in Canada or London or whatever. So um, there and there isn't really, I'm not really up against that fingers crossed yet for um, in the science fiction realm. But, um, and I think, yeah, I think further down the track that will start to emerge that um, the windows for Netflix and Amazon premieres will close. Um, and whereas I sort of set the dates for this festival back in January, um, and started to acquire films. I'm, I'm always asking now is there's not going to be any online premiere. It's not going to Netflix, you know, in a few months time. And there's whatever contracts I sign with the filmmakers, there's always a caveat saying, well, everything's null and void. If suddenly you turn up on, on Netflix six weeks before the festival. Right. Hmm, fair enough. Look, the, the final question that I had, and I am going to get to you, um, Dan, because I have some podcasting questions that I really want to look into. Um, that, that's good because I stopped paying attention because Simon was talking. So. <laughs> Frankly, I stopped paying attention about halfway through as well. So. <laughs> no, and I, it, I just really wanted to know if there's a particular film that uh, that you have looked into that you're kind of going, yes, look, I'm really looking forward to seeing this one in the festival or one that you think, uh, look, me, I'll leave it at that, one that you are looking forward to seeing. 
At my festival coming up? Yes, that's been screened, yeah, for the audience to view. Uh, I can give you an exclusive. We haven't announced this anywhere yet. We probably won't be for a little while, but we have a 4K restoration of the classic Australian film Plain Beatty Bow, a time travel story based on the Ruth Park novel that was very popular back in the day and in conjunction with Umbrella Entertainment, who were putting out the, the 4K restoration disc, I think around Christmas time, um, we'll be staging that. So I am looking forward to seeing that. I haven't seen that in 40 odd years. So I'm keen to see that on, on our big screen. Thank you so much for that. I remember seeing that in high school. Um, now, I don't exactly know where it fit in, but the I love that film, but the creep factor in that movie is quite impressive. <laughs> I Look, I've got to be honest with you, I haven't seen it since, I think it was 85 it came out, so what's 86, so it's its 35th anniversary or something. So That's um, brilliant. I'm, I'm very excited about seeing, especially about seeing what the Masters at Umbrella, who are just so great with their restorations, do with the, the print, which they'll be scrubbing each frame, they'll be cleaning it, um, you know, with a fine tooth comb or wherever they restore old prints. So, yeah, I'm very excited about that. It'll look glorious. Dan, you were the co creator and producer um, of the Handmaid's Tale podcast, um, Eyes and Gilead. Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, because as you can tell, I, I watched that all the way. Um, <laughs> so you can correct me on the pronunciation. Um, but it did win um, bronze in the 2020 Australian Podcast Awards for Best Arts and Culture Podcast, as well as uh, Best Fan Cast Award in 2019 for the Australian Podcast. So fantastic result, mate. Congratulations on that. Yeah, so I mean, credit where it's due. Basically, I wasn't there for that second award, but I certainly participated in the first season of that podcast. So, you know, I'll claim that. And I was on stage and got to see the ladies of Eyes on Gilead all, you know, definitely get their dues on on stage. So that was all very cool. Uh, basically, I guess the one thing that I always warn people who are consuming media, warning, this sounds so dodgy. <laughs> to as well. The one thing that I also warn people is that if you're watching something, Okay, so let me just backtrack a little bit. Uh, this morning, I okay, so I published this newsletter called Always Be Watching. Yes. And the newsletter, and you can sign up for it, alwaysbewatching.com. It's a weekly, uh, it was a daily newsletter that talks about the latest news and screen culture effectively. But there was a story that was uh, came to my attention this morning and it was Russell T Davies, who's the guy that used to make Queer as Folk and he had a lot of success with the series this year called It's a Sin. And he was running Doctor Who for a couple of years. He's a very outspoken uh, gay TV writer. He's very passionate about LGBTQI issues. And he was talking about the rise of streaming platforms these days who are very openly saying about how much they want to support LGBTQI themes. So you may have noticed there was a TV show Loki recently where yes. the lovable trickster rogue that we've been watching through all the Marvel films, mm -hmm. it was suddenly revealed that he was bisexual. And the series itself kind of gives lip service to the idea of it, but doesn't actually explore that as a deep theme. So one of the things I warn people in my newsletter is that beware of these large companies that are out there that are purporting to be on the cutting edge of being progressive and doing the right thing for their audience, because everyone always has an agenda. And the yeah. agenda of the streamers who are saying, oh, you know, we're very welcoming of all and look at us sort of pushing these themes like their agenda is really quite different to yours where you might say, hey, look, I actually want to see these themes explored and actually get some real substantive conversations around issues like that. But if you're Disney, for example, it's really beneficial to have a character say, I'm bisexual, and then spend the next two episodes with him in a love relationship with the woman that he's telling this, hmm. that he's bisexual to. Because uh, you don't want to upset middle America and some countries that may not necessarily be on board, that kind of thing. Like Disney's agenda is different to uh, people who actually really care about these as themes. Yeah. So getting back to what you're actually talking about with this podcast, which is that there's this great podcast. If you're a big fan of The Handmaid's Tale, uh, when I was at SBS, myself and the aforementioned Fiona Williams, the two of us created this podcast called Eyes on Gilead. And it's a weekly debrief for people to come along and listen to what's going on in The Handmaid's Tale each week. And it's a week by week exploration into the show. Now, while that's all very good and well, what people listening to it probably don't quite realize is that the podcast is content marketing. So like, it's, it's a very soft push for content marketing. We were trying to create the best possible show that we could for audiences to enjoy it. But at the same time, if you're listening to it, you'll also hear conversations about SBS. You'll hear conversations about when the show is being broadcast. It's really about attaching the SBS name to this international show that they'd acquired. 
because The Handmaid's Tale isn't of SBS. It's just the show that they've purchased for SBS. Mm -hmm. So what we needed to do was just get the word out there that The Handmaid's Tale is on SBS and not to pirate the show, which was a big concern when we launched this podcast back in 2017, 18. I don't know. I've got no idea of time anymore. COVID life has really just destroyed me. Uh, so the idea was just to get the messaging out saying, hey, look, Handmaid's Tale, it's an SBS show here. Watch it. Don't subscribe to like the overseas Hulu and use your credit card through nefarious ways to get access to that service. You can actually get it day and date here. We're doing the right thing by you. And it was really just getting that messaging out there. Thankfully, because of the quality of the podcast itself, it has managed to generate a very large listenership now. There's awards coming through for it because it is a legitimately very well-produced, very mm. good podcast. But at the same time, it is also advertising for The Handmaid's Tale on SBS. And you should never really quite get away from that. So I guess what I wanted to come to here is just saying that podcasts exist for all sorts of reasons and even the yes. best-intentioned ones. Like, listen to who's making it. So myself and Simon produce this podcast, Screen Watching, Neither of us are making any money. In fact, I think I've lost several hundred dollars making it. And also I made sure spend, of that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and also I have to spend an hour each week talking to Simon. So we're all taking a massive loss on this thing. Um, but ultimately, when you listen to our podcast, you'll hear that these are honest thoughts and honest reviews yes. and opinions. And it's certainly not bothered by anything else because it is a pure independent enterprise. And much like this podcast here, like, I mean, you did pay us $50 each to, you know, get, no, that's not true. What? There's no money. No, what? I, I, I post dated this. $50? The check's in the mail, I guarantee you. Oh, so you've got a check account. That fills me full of wonder and hope, yeah. So, this is an independent podcast. And like, I think it's really great Very to participate in this kind of thing because like, you're probably not going to get more than the 30,000 listeners we get on every single Oh, of course, no. <laughs> ultimately this is about the passion for it it's about coming together and making something together and playing around with honest thoughts and building community around these things there's all sorts of fun things you can do with podcasting and you can do some nefarious things like advertise high quality drama series to an sbs audience i love it that's the gamut has been covered beautifully there <laughs> <laughs> but i have to ask because what was it exactly that well what do you feel that the podcasting medium can be so powerful, you know, in the context of audio that influences people? I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why it does, but one of the things that's really particularly unique to podcasting is that most podcasts are listened to with people with earbuds in and uh, isolated from whatever world they're in while they're listening to the podcast. And so what that does is it's a different relationship than people listening to radio. So a lot of radio is consumed in the car. Okay, so it's often people, and look at people driving around, it's pretty rare you see more than one person sitting in a car. Mm. But they're listening to it with audio surrounding themselves in the entire car. And it's not necessarily a personal experience. It's personal-ish, but it's not necessarily a deeply personal thing. Like they're not strictly in your ears in the way that a podcast is. So I think that you get people listening to a podcast who have such great intimacy that they experience through the experience the experience of the experience uh there's so such intimacy that they develop while listening to a podcast and it's so unique that you know what else do you listen to with headphones on you listen to music generally and music you'd have a personal experience with but it's not necessarily an intimate experience in the way that hearing simon's delicious voice coming to my ears every friday morning when i check through the podcast like that's a really unique experience that listening in a car isn't really the same thing because you may have someone else in the car with you so you've got a shared experience and that's something entirely different. But podcasts, I don't know how many people listen to podcasts with other people in a room. That's got to be pretty rare, surely. There's also Simon an element of... Oh, sorry, Jose. So there's, there's also an element of podcasting that almost brings it full circle back to the um, radio show um, family gathered around the wooden box element that, that hmm. started off radio. Crazy. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So And, and um, that's when uh, you're listening and it's a very personal experience. That's why some of the very best podcasts... Um, have very high production techniques or, or, or um, things like the, the Serial podcast or the, mm -hmm. um, the Mark Maron podcast, which use very sort of intimate audio techniques to, to really get into your head and really engage with the listeners in a way that radio, which is often, even when you're tuned to what you want to hear on radio, it's still background noise. There's still the rest of the world going on around you. As Dan points out, this, the podcasting is often a very solitary experience. And, and I guess that, to a certain extent, is why um, uh, forums and discussion groups and online panels discussing podcasts and bringing podcasts together have really boomed because then there is that 
community element, that shared element that has to come together at some point because that's not happening in the in the listening of it. Yeah, I mean, one of the things to think about is, and just speaking about community, I've got listeners who were listening to my old podcast, Televised Revolution, since the mid-2000s, mm -hmm. and they're listening to Screen Watching now. Like, they've followed me through, and I'm really thankful to these guys for yeah. supporting me the way they have over the years. But these are people who I probably never would have encountered in real life, but I have met a few of them over the years because, you know, they'll just be around, they'll see me somewhere and come over and say hi. Uh, but, like, these are people who are generally, they find through the intimacy of podcasting, a sense of community they feel that they're part of a broader and with my podcasting i've always had facebook groups and other community elements there so there's always a mechanism to facilitate a community building around it yeah but they feel that they're part of that community because there is that intimacy there's a sense that they can contact us as hosts quite like with great ease and hear our thoughts and opinions and we'll talk back to them be very active in maintaining that conversation and they'll follow us through and if you think about that in like a radio uh, sort of context People listen to radio celebrities and some uh, radio presenters and they'll listen to a presenter for years and years. But if that presenter isn't there for one week, like they might be a little bit disappointed, but you mm. can sever that quite easily. Mm. I've had many months off between podcasts at various points in my life, but that community still stuck with me and found me in my next venture as it went on. And I don't think that's necessarily strictly true for a lot of radio relationships between radio and listener. I think in my case, um, any listeners will just be consistently disappointed because they have me every week. But what I wanted to, <laughs> what I wanted to touch on though, was there's an element then, that transmedia. You know, it's something that um, I kind of was a buzz. I think around 2015, 16, because it was so. You know, I think UNSW is still is doing some courses on transmedia, mm -hmm. and I go into that because I feel and both of you are more than qualified to correct me on this, which is why I want to ask this question. Do we do enough of it? So especially with a podcasting medium to breach additional um, or broaden in an audience from, you know, a, a, a product, whether it's a film um, or a television series, and do we have the capacity to do, you know, what Star Wars did? I know that could be maybe budget driven, but, do you think there's potential for Australia to really start embracing what we can do with transmedia or this has already happened and I'm just, you know, really far behind on what's out there? I mean, in a sense, that's kind of what we were doing with that Handmaid's Tale podcast, which okay. is that we've got a TV program on the air and we we're looking to connect with people in different ways. So we were doing that through the web with regular recaps of the show, with articles that further themes about the TV show, that explainers as to hey, the show referenced the um, Ronald Reagan, uh, what's the ad campaign he ran in the mid 80s? It was a uh, good day for America or something like that. I forget the actual mm -hmm. name of it. But like, I remember writing an explainer about what that ad was all right, about. Okay. In an Australian context, we didn't really understand that. Like there'd be a lot of people who that sort of went over their heads. So it was providing sort of greater textual themes to it. And then as the podcast on the side, like that kind of is that transmedia. But I'd say that that podcast is probably a little bit unique where there's not a lot of that going on. You, yes, mm. you do find that, say, with Farmer Wants a Wife on Channel 9, there'll be articles in the 9 newspapers and websites that will have sort of recaps and try to create enthusiasm over what happened on last night's uh, show. And publicists at 9 would probably sort of feed stories through to various FM breakfast shows. But it's not really quite the same way. It's not part of a strict continuum of conversation and engagement with the audience over this one thing. So I don't know if that's strictly transmedia, but it also mm. kind of is in a really sort of nefarious, um, disconnected way. First of all, I'm just amazed it took this long for Dan to work farmer wants a wife into the discussion. It's funny. <laughs> I know, it's shocking. Yeah, it usually happens well before this. Um, I would also say that the the concept of transmedia, which I can't say I'm familiar with in, a, in any sort of complex way, but the, the concept of having, quote unquote, a blockbuster podcast, and you can name the ones on, you know, two hands that have, that have really mm. broken out and, and been huge both here in Australia and around the world. Even the term huge is a sort of relative term. Um, and this is a, a, an argument I've gotten into a few times with um, people who say that, that you know, when, when MASH finished, it run, finished its run, there were 3.7 million people watching that last episode. That wouldn't happen now because the media landscape is so fractured. There's just not that many people watching broadcast. Look at Dan chomping at the bit to say <laughs> yeah. something. 
You said 3.7 million. It was like 78 million people. It was like- that's what I'm. That's my point exactly. I'm totally guessing what the numbers are. But when you talk about when you talk about one um, uh, uh, broadcasting outlet having all those eyeballs, that just wouldn't happen anymore. Um, and yes, I guess you can quote sort of the blockbuster film numbers or some of the numbers that are coming through on Netflix, but there's still a fraction of what used to be the used to be the the norm for for the for the um, in, in the entertainment business. Um, and whether that can ever be achieved over any great length of time in the world of podcasting, I don't know if it can be. Yeah, fair enough. It's I think the fractured landscape will allow for a greater diversity and hopefully. It has allowed and it continues sure. to do so. Um, Dan, one last question. Do hmm. you see, you know, do you have any future projects for podcasting akin to The Handmaid's Tale 1? Or is perhaps there's like a, there's a dramatic or there's a dramatist lurking somewhere <laughs> looking to do an audio drama? So look, I mean, The Handmaid's Tale podcast came about because I was working at SBS in content yes. marketing there. And there was a very specific need for that kind of a podcast to come out. I've regularly got ideas for other podcasts and you sort of mentioned like the sort of dramas her sort of idea. I was thinking, and this is going back about seven or eight years ago, that there was this great space for scripted narrative podcasts embracing the idea of the radio plays of yesterday and bringing it to a podcast medium. And I've still got a few ideas that haven't really quite been explored that, well, haven't quite been done yet that I think probably could actually get some traction. Uh, I'm trying to remember what your question was exactly, but... Um, like I've often got ideas around that kind of thing, but I'm probably more interested at the moment in just focusing on the podcasts that I'm doing at the moment. So we've got screen watching, which yes. requires a lot more time and energy than I really expected before we started this darn thing. Um, I'm right now thinking about the three screeners I need to watch now. It's nine o'clock at night. Oh, wow. Watch that before I go to bed so I can talk to Simon at eight o'clock tomorrow morning to yeah. knock out this podcast. Uh, but then I've got that, but I've also got this other podcast I do called the Oz Media Report, and that's yes. AUS Report. Um, and sorry, the Oz, yeah, Oz Media Report. And with that, I'm running it probably for six weeks, I think, for this current season of it. And every week it's talking to people from across the media industry in Australia, trying to bring context to some of the bigger, broader ideas that we discuss within the media. So I've had issues where we talked about the rise of QAnon within an Australian context mm-hmm. and how the media fuels that. Uh, there was episodes about um, just about podcasting and radio professionals finding their way into radio these days. Uh, as part of the second season, I recorded an interview with uh, Margaret Simons, who's a very well-respected uh, media writer and academic. And I was talking to her about the rise of Sky News in Australia and uh, how there's the general perception based off a new story that came out a couple of months ago that Sky News may not have massive TV viewership, but it's got a really big online reach. Mm. Uh, she did a bit of a study into this and found that's actually really not quite true. There's some articles, uh, some videos that they post to YouTube that do do remarkably well, but by and large, it's actually a pretty flat, um, you know, a couple of thousand people are watching each of these videos. So the concerns that a lot of people have around Sky News may not necessarily quite be there. So I talked to her for about 15, 20 minutes on the podcast the other day about that. And it's a really fascinating chat. I'm talking to this guy tomorrow afternoon for next week's podcast. It's a guy named Leo, and I've forgotten his surname all of a sudden. Uh, essentially, he's a guy that runs a online streaming news service called Channel 6 News. And he's, I'm not sure how old he is. I want to say he's maybe like 15, 16 years old. He's wow. a young kid and he looks every bit his age. And I've been fascinated by him because he keeps on coming up in my social feeds. And people are always talking to him. And this week, YouTube banned him because uh, there's a lot of concern about COVID-19 denialism out there. Mm-hmm. And he had a series of stories on his news. He does a half-hour news show every morning wow. with video mixed in of various news stories and his opinion in there. And it's a really complex thing coming out from a couple of teenagers somewhere in Melbourne who are producing this uh, video. I don't quite know enough about it. I've got to get across a bit more. But YouTube banned him because he was presenting both sides of the COVID debate, if it even is a debate. And he was just saying that, you know, there were these negative things, but we countered that with correct journalism and we had like the right viewpoint, but YouTube still banned him. So he got onto some live streaming thing yesterday. I'm not even sure what he was streaming on exactly, but I saw it copied over to Twitter, which is how I saw it. And he's just like this really passionate sort of young kid. And he was talking with a very sort of um, adult vocab about the situation and the various ethics involved in that banning. And 
it's this really fiery, passionate speech. And I need to learn more about this kid. So I've got him on the podcast tomorrow and we're going to have a chat about that. So at the moment, I probably not necessarily want to play around in these ideas I have for other podcasts. Really, I just want to focus on these couple of podcasts I'm doing right now, do what I can with them. And then I guess maybe sort of when their time's run, then maybe move on to the next thing. I'm passionate about podcasting generally. Yes. And I've got lots of ideas for podcasts, but at the same time, there's only so many hours in the day. Mm. I do two podcasts. I do a daily newsletter that goes out. I do a weekend uh, wrap of the newsletter. And then I've got my wife and some dogs that need walking and then you Simon the, 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 and ego. And you got you know, the hydroponic garden out the back as well. You've got to, you've got to distribute that as much as well, that, that's my upcoming YouTube series, but we need some legalization happening before that. Ends up. <laughs> His way out there. He doesn't, everyone. That is a joke. He doesn't have it out in the back garden. He has it in the laundry. Just sort of put it <laughs> one side. Yeah, as if I'd go outside. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Look, it's a shame that he was banned from YouTube, but I mean, you got to get around the algorithms. Maybe he can throw in some like funny cat videos or something and then <laughs> boom. <laughs> Look, he was banned, but then he put in like a very passionate defense and they unban him a couple of hours later. But well, yeah, it's a fun story. I, I, mean, I love like, it. It's yeah you know it, but youth and that's what that's what youth is all about and having their creativity and passion and well, that's exactly it i mean like what he's doing like he's got a passion for the news and so a podcast probably doesn't make sense for him but a daily youtube series where he's presenting a news program like you know that's a passion thing for him now and as i said he's like a young teenager now in a couple of years and i don't know i'm going to get to know him tomorrow but in theory, like that probably sets him up for a career in journalism going forward if that's what he wants to do. Absolutely. And look, I am weary of the time, guys. Um, so I'm going to try to round this off. I know we didn't really get to screen watching podcast, but um, I want to ask one more question because, you know, passion is something that's so important. Um, and, you know, in my case, like yourself and Simon here at Diary of Crowdfunder Film, we search for the truth which like an onion reveals itself after many layers. And so is it true that some time ago you started an online petition to bring back the Golden Girls as an animated series? Oh boy, here we go. Because <laughs> yeah. I'd like you, if you could elaborate on this act of clicktivism. <laughs> okay, so this was a late night thought that I was having, which was, there's a thing that happens in Canadian television where a sitcom will be, well, this is what it stemmed from. So. In, in Canada, there's a number of TV shows, which you may have sort of stumbled across, but like, you know, they're never really the biggest shows in the world by any means. But there's been and a like, trend. You can't do that on television. That was, well, I mean, that was fantastic. Unfortunately, this one, that, one, that wasn't adapted. Uh, but sorry, I just had another thought then. Oh, sorry, I'm going to follow that up elsewhere. You just remind me of something very important that I need to do with my day-to-day -day newsletter business. Oh, but you've got this sort of thing where there's TV series, like say, for example, Corner Gas, uh, there was Trailer Park Boys, which people in Australia probably mm -hmm. are more familiar with than Corner Gas, although Corner Gas did play on SBS on Friday nights for quite a few years there, but nobody saw it. Uh, but you've got these Canadian sitcoms, and for some reason, after a couple of years, they were able to get money to turn them into animated series. So Corner Gas, which is literally just about a guy who runs a local um, service station in the middle of you know nowhere in Canada, and he's got quirky people that stop by the store and he gets involved in quirky conversations with them. That's the extent of that program. It's now an animated series. And that makes no sense at all to me at all. But I was thinking about that. And then it dawned on me that there's probably like older shows from yesteryear that people are actually really passionate about that you could bring back as an animated series. And I thought about the Golden Girls. Like it's inevitable. There's going to be a Golden Girls reboot at some point. And I've got no interest in seeing that whatsoever. Like that just sounds like the worst idea in the world. Because that show worked because he had some very specific characters and mm -hmm. some very specific performances that brought it all out. But why not take the initial sort of idea, the conceits of those performances and animate them and bring them to a platform which could live on forever? And there's actually a show called uh, The Adventures of Gumball something or other. It's like a water, uh, like a Cartoon Network show. Yes, yes, um, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, you're more familiar with it than I am, I suspect. But there was an episode where they had some animated Golden Girls characters in it for like about 30 seconds, like a bit of a throwaway joke. But like I floated the idea of the animated Golden Girls and then someone mentioned that to me on Twitter and I took a look and it's like maybe not the animation style I'd be after specifically, but you could actually see it there. Like it is a idea that would play remarkably well. I, re I could be an animated si uh, sitcom, but I put this uh, like 
petition out there and I just couldn't get the traction. And here I am. I remember when you, I remember when you first brought it up, Dan, and, and, um, you were quite animated about it. You, you were ringing me through the night with ideas and, and, um, (laughs) um, going around handing out cards in shopping centers to people to get them to sign your petition. And you did that time in juvie because of it. So I'm, (laughs) I was, I was, um, I was all for it. I signed the petition four times. Um, I think there's nine signatures, so that's almost half. <laughs> look, um, look, thank you so much for indulging me with that because I couldn't help myself when I was, you know, doing my PI work to try to get some some questions and that's have a bit of fun a deep with dive. this. <laughs> it is. Look, and you know, they say life is but a series of moments, and some trivial, challenging, but hopefully mostly memorable and positive. So they also say you can't spell trivial without trivia. So, gentlemen, for the first time in the history of this show, I'd like to end it with some film and television trivia. Oh. I haven't christened the title yet, so I'm open to suggestions. Well, let's see how Silence we go. Silence or off a great be, start. It could be the bet. Well, let's see how we go. It could be um, Jose's awesome trivia contest or Jose's stupid <laughs> idea trivia contest. So let's see what happens. <laughs> or you could just hang around any trivia night and just like steal one of the many obvious ideas that regularly get thrown out. So I think every trivia show I've ever been to, there's been a trivia Newton John. Good. Right. That's well, good. Um, for this one, I'm actually going to put a, a jacket on because... You know, for the listeners at home, this is great podcasting. No one can see me putting a jacket on. Oh, this is formal trivia. This is very interesting. No, no, I just felt like wearing a jacket. Oh, <laughs> uh, you've gone the, the black jacket over the black There we go. So look. I've just, okay. I've just well, tried to go black on black. So sorry, if, if you're really sort of coming to the party here professionally sort of garbed up, I'm going to garb down. I'm love gonna, wow. I'm going to take off the hoodie and reveal my Condor Man t-shirt. I love it. Oh, well, and Simon's now fishing around. Okay, good, good. I like this. Gone. This is, it's already generating something of its own. Yes, that's and fantastic. I'm going, to, I'm going to promote the Sydney you Science Fiction Film Festival love t-shirts. See- These Sorry. are available online through the Sydney Science Fiction Film Festival website. That is, that is stock. That's a stock image. I didn't pay anything for that. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, oops, I just locked my microphone. What about yourself, Dan? Are you going to plug in for AWB or... Oh, Maybe yeah, so, screen watching. Yeah. So if people want to check out the always be watching newsletter, basically every morning I knock out a series of, I always say it's between eight to 10 stories, but it works out more about 14 or 15 these days. Uh, it's basically wake up, get your cereal, like sit down, you'll find a newsletter hit your inbox somewhere between eight to eight thirty in the morning. And it is just a series of eight news stories that relates to the world of primarily TV, but a few like movie things in there. Anything that's on a screen gets covered in this newsletter Five days a week, you get a bonus edition on Friday afternoons with a guide to all the movies and TV shows that have started streaming that week. Um, it's free. People can sign up at alwaysbewatching.com. And I do this little podcast with Simon Foster called Screen Watching. And people yeah, look, find that in any place that has podcasts in an app. If you get a chance, do read some of um, Dan's uh, Always Be Watching newsletters. They are, they are fantastic. I almost finished one just the other day. They're really <laughs> terrific. I'm reminded right now, Simon and I used to try to do podcast recordings late at night. And when I say late at night, I'm sort of like eight, nine o'clock. Like and as I've been muttering away here, barely able to form coherent sentences, I'm reminded now why we don't do podcasts at night time anymore. That's well, right. They were a couple of very special editions of screen watching, weren't they? Just like this one will be. Then look, gentlemen, I'll add that not only will you be playing for the title of the greatest diary of a crowdfunded film trivia slash genius and all the gloating rights that come with this venerative championship, <laughs> but you'll also be taking home a platinum Paramount edition DVD of a film that was lit, photographed by Emmanuel Lubezki, a.k.a. El Chivo, with a budget of $109 million and a worldwide take of 133960541 So maybe you want to take a stab at the dark, see who this might be. It's okay. I'll show you now. Paramount? Can, can you give us a year or is that too much information? No, I can give you the year. The like year the is because I've got it right here. Oh, so it's pre-owned, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and my kids don't need it anymore, so it's good. Um, damn, where, you'd think it'd be easier to find a year, and I've got glasses mm. on. Does it help if it was produced by... I, I'm trying to highlight the best points, the best parts of it, like the cinematographer being El Chivo, one of the producers being Brian, Gra- Brian Grazier. So I'll just... You're playing for Cat in oh, the Hat, gentlemen. The- <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, by the look of displeasure on your face, I knew you two could truly appreciate this cinematic treat. 
So, oh, wow, that I, I remember seeing that. I remember seeing that at the movies, um, and I remember they actually played one of the reels out of order. So you saw like the middle of the film at the start, and then the beginning, came, and I, and nobody knew the difference. The audience, <laughs> they came out. That the manager came out and apologized, and the audience just went, "No, nah, whatever." <laughs> Play it. So this that may be the reaction we receive after these questions. So, gentlemen, sorry, can I just ask some cut and hat questions? Uh, this mm. film did this come out pre or post Love Guru? Pre. Yeah. Okay. I still can't believe I watched The Love Guru ahead of Cat in the Heart. <laughs> he really has had trouble sort of maintaining his big screen career. Well, old Mike Myers. And I'm a fan. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I love him, but they were oh, look, tough films to watch. I do as well. I actually bought a print of Wayne and Garth walking to the um, like hockey theme donut shop. Yeah. It arrived in the post today. I'm very excited to put wow, this on. Wow. Look at you. Yeah. Even in the 90s. <laughs> So I'd like you, you know, names will be buzzers as always. Sure. Don't pull any punches now because there is a great prize up for grabs. <laughs> and uh, As well so, as the DVD? No, no, that is it. Oh, <laughs> and the love of just these amazing questions that are coming up. So question number one. Sure. And just wait until I've read out the answer, read out the question or the answer, obviously. Uh, so Faulty Towers only had a run of two seasons consisting of six episodes each. What year were the seasons first released? Simon. Um, Go ahead. I am going to say 74, 75. So I'll give you one point because 75 was when season one was released on oh. October 24th. Uh, Dan, I'll throw to you for a... Oh, look, I mean like Falsy Towers is a big blind spot for me. So if season one was 75, the presumption would be that it's 76, but also I'm going to say 77. I'm going to say there was a year in between because it's British TV and they do that. Look, from the sources that I've that I've obtained, it was supposedly Monday, February 19th, 1979, Ooh. that uh, it was released. Now, I know that they, it took them, it was taking them roughly two months to write one episode. Um and I'm a massive Faulty Towers fan, so, you know, I don't know if we can excuse that one. <laughs> All right, question number two. So that one, so one point to Simon there. Uh, you might get this one, Dan, okay? So which of the Golden Girls <laughs> appears in a 1999 action comedy horror involving a gigantic croc? Oh, well, sorry. Oh, I know, Simon. No, oh, sorry, okay. I shouldn't have asked the question. I should have just buzzed. <laughs> so, I know it. It's Betty White and she stars in Lake Placid. Absolutely. Didn't come back for the sequel. No, she didn't no. come back for the sequel, no. I think there was a third one as well, wasn't there? Like, There's well, a whole series of them on yeah, in the like Deep Blue Jamie and... Hi-Fi right now. I presume that's next week's prize giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got enough money for this one. and that, my, my whole budget went for this. <laughs> uh, number three, what is the name of the character voiced by John Lovitz in the animated TV series The Critic? Sorry, Dan, I'm going to buzz in here now that I've worked out how the game works. I believe that would be Jay Sherman. It is Jay Sherman. Now, for extra points, what is his full name? Ooh. That's a good question. Um... Look, I, I can't answer that, and neither can Simon. I know that. No. Yeah. Okay, that's fair enough. And I wouldn't have known this either. It's Jay uh, Prescott Sherman the fourth. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Can I say that the critic has one of my favorite dirty jokes on television of all time? Which one's that? There's an episode with, he's got a sister in the show and she's a um, 15 year old girl, but she's turning 16 and thus staging a sweet 16, like Debbie's horn um, ball for her. Uh, like she's, she's coming out to society. So she's there being uh, groomed by like the person who's like choosing a dress and stuff. And the lady who's got a dress asks her, um, you know, I've got a white dress for you. And then she sort of leans into her and says, can I give you a white dress? As though, you know, the sort of idea that she's pure and, you know, mm. and the girl immediate response back, just disgusted saying, yes, of course, except for the gloves. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. That is very good. It's a great joke. Moving on. What was the first film directed by a woman to gross over $100 million at the box office? Simon. Yes. Uh, Point Break didn't make that much money. <laughs> no, I was going to say Catherine Bigelow had a, didn't do it. I, I might say The Piano by Jane Campion. 
did it make it to 100 million? See, I thought it was um, the Catherine Bigelow one, but actually the answer is big, directed by Penny oh, Marshall course. with Tom well, Hanks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, first film, 1988. Good one. Number five, Andre Brower, who plays Captain Holt in Brooklyn Nine-Nine, starred in which 2006 film directed by Frank Darabont? 2006. The Mist? Yes, but um, because you didn't say your name, Dan gets a point. Oh, come on! <laughs> <laughs> Number six, and we're heading into multiple choice, guys. There's only four more to go. And look, I thank you for holding up with this. Sure. What is the highest grossing horror franchise to date? Inflation not taken into account. Um, a, Halloween. So the Halloween universe. B, the Saw franchise, C, the Conjuring universe, or D, the Aliens universe? Dan? Yes. Uh, the choice is actually F, the Police Academy series. <laughs> I would have gone that. <laughs> um, but I did buzz in, so of, of course I'm going to say the Saw franchise. It's actually, no, it's incorrect. Um <laughs> Uh, it, it's the Conjuring universe. Yeah, uh, I was going to say 1.9 billion to date. Um, but I'm going to give you extra points for the Police Academy reference. Well, you're just giving away points now. What sort of trivia contest is this? <laughs> I'm clearly the smarter, and yet he's getting all the points. More handsome. Three more to go. So number seven, the first 3D feature film was shown in what year? A, 1933, B, 1922, C, 1955. Or D, 1898. Dan. Hazarding. Simon. Okay. Already said Dan. Nice. Yeah, Dan. Just... Uh, no, Simon. No. Um, <laughs> uh, the 30s one. Uh, it was actually 1922. It oh, was uh, The Power of Love, about five reels long, first feature. Uh, two more questions to go. Does anyone know the technology there? Uh, no. I'm sure you can find it in. It may have been appropriated in the British Museum. It could be there, very likely. I'll get on that Wikipedia. <laughs> exactly. Complete this spoken line by Samuel L. Jackson's character in Deep Blue Sea. You think water moves fast. You should see A, fire. B, Tom Cruise in Days of Thunder. C, ice. Or D, Australia's NBN. <laughs> C, ice. Simon, C, ice. That is correct. Um, and actually, I love the thing that it's the, the actual uh, line is you think water moves fast, you should see ice, it moves like it has a mind, like it knows it killed the once the world once and got a taste for murder. It's, uh, I love it. Samuel Number L. Nine. Jackson, is there nothing he can't do? Actually, there no. is nothing he can't do, he does everything. Absolutely. <laughs> the second last <laughs> question, oh, gentlemen, gosh. and then the nightmare is over for you. The <laughs> flux capacitor in the DeLorean requires how much electrical power to operate. Simon, <laughs> 1.21 gigawatts. Yes. Uh, Simon, I think you'll find the actual answer is the power of love. Ah, that's nice. <laughs> and the final question, and please let me get through the options because I scoured, you know, and appropriated many answers just to, for this to come up. Uh, so what is the name of Quint's shark hunting boat in Jaws? A, the Codfather. B, the Orca. C, Aquaholic. Or D, Cirrhosis of the river. <laughs> oh my god! You want it, Dan? No, I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the orca, but I love the other ones. How much research did you actually do to come up with the other ones? Because they're great. Uh, the look, I, there's a little site called. Uh, I'm giving someone a plug who you know is probably going to regret this, and not for any reason. It's just it took me hours, and eventually I came up to a site with I think it was Boat Australian Names, and it had all these funny names. So you know, it's brilliant. Look, gentlemen, well played, sir. Well played. I, that was great. I lost track of who was winning. <laughs> um, so I've seen the prize. You can have it, Dan. So you know, exactly. It's the thing. Look, no one knows exactly who won. So it would be unfair for either myself or Simon to take this prize. So maybe it carries over to the next. Lovely. Episode. I love it. It'll carry on. It can be the, the carry on, you know, the carry over crappy prize. Plus, um, I know for a fact that Dan doesn't have a DVD player. He's anti-physical <laughs> media. So that's that's where that little bit of uh, uh, goodwill comes from. And because I know um, I'm, you know, and it was just an excuse for me to just get the address of you guys. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So look, Simon, by default, 
the two best words in the English language default <laughs> you can have. <laughs> I'll send it to you. Um, look, guys, thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. I hope that, you know, you found it to be of some value and that especially the people that are listening have enjoyed hearing, especially putting all jokes aside, what you guys are doing. Matthew Eel said there's a handful of people in Australia who are kind of podcasting and really talking about cinema and television and media with such passion and, you know, with obvious knowledge, whether, and you guys will joke about that, but the decades of experience that you guys bring and the passion, it really transcends what we hear. And it's what allows us to continue enjoying um, and celebrating cinema in this country. So, you know, thank you for what you guys are doing and everyone of that ilk. Uh, no, mate, thank you for, for putting this together, for, for um, sort of championing, that's a tough word to say this time of night, but championing um, what we do through what you do. And we, we really appreciate it. So we're honoured to be on here. Look, I mean, it's very nice of you to say. I didn't hear the word handsome once in that, though. So. <laughs> that's true. He didn't say handsome. I am a bit upset about that. <laughs> With a, the do a dose of double handsome from the duo screen watch podcast please check them out, out. <laughs> it is too late thank you so much guys and to everyone else you know until next time ciao